All right, well, uh, in that case, good um, morning, afternoon, uh, evening, depending on the time zone. We've kind of got a, a span, I think, from at least from Toronto to Singapore. Um, I'll start kind of very briefly um, introducing us and the idea behind this roundtable. Um, my name is Max Scalin. I'm a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies and at the International Center for Tax and Development. My colleague, Vanessa van den Bogart, who is also a research fellow at IDS and ICTD and is based at the University of Toronto. Um, we're leading a research project on informality and taxation within the ICTD. And as may be the same for, for many of you, as the um, COVID-19 pandemic has spread across the world, this increasingly began to change um, kind of the, not just the groups and circumstances that we were looking at, but also the conversation we were having with, um, with colleagues, academics, activists, policymakers, um, trade unionists from various countries around the world. And we're increasingly finding that we're, having, we're all having the same conversations, asking ourselves the same questions around informal economies and, and this crisis. Um, so this roundtable is kind of an attempt to bring these conversations together and bring together some of the people we've been having them with. So when we thought of this, we thought that Ideally, maybe there's a, there's a dozen or two dozen people who'd be interested in this. Um, when we checked the registration this morning, I think 360 people signed up for this. So we had to um, cap the Zoom number and uh, more people are following us on YouTube. And we're thrilled with this interest and, and really looking forward to this, to this conversation. Um, so uh, from kind of our perspective, I think there's um, about kind of three central pillars to this conversation. I think there's the, uh, the effect of the pandemic on informal economies, effects of the relief efforts that we're seeing around the world, and then kind of the role that, that research can play in this. And I'll start with some, some very brief remarks on these and then, then hand over to, to our speakers. So as I think nobody in this um, virtual room needs telling, workers in the informal economy across the globe have been particularly vulnerable to this pandemic. Um, they've been vulnerable from a health aspect. So working in crowded market spaces, in their employers' homes, or as transport and care workers, they're frequently on the front lines of this pandemic. At the same time, their access to healthcare is often restricted. The absence of institutionalized sick pay can create a direct trade-off between caring for their health and sustaining their livelihoods. And they've been vulnerable financially, especially in the context of widespread lockdowns. Many have lost their main source of income. Working from home is impossible for many. Savings and access to finance and are often limited. The um, effects that both kind of potentially new stigmas around informality and hygiene and the global employment crisis will have on livelihoods in the informal economy in the medium terms are also hugely worrying. Um, so even though they are particularly vulnerable, many relief efforts have, have passed them by. Um, a significant set of economic programs around the world um, that were aimed at kind of bolstering the economic shock have been built on pre-existing institutional relationships between states and businesses. They've come in the forms of tax relief, delayed tax filing or payment deadlines, um, many of which of course don't reach business in the informal sector. The same is true for specific bailouts, which are typically, typically directed towards larger enterprises um, and wage subsidy or furlough schemes that target workers with a formal employment contract. One of the few policy tools that are often more specifically cited at being aimed at reaching the informal economy are direct cash transfers, which according to Gentili et al's tracker currently make up about a third of the social assistance relief efforts that we're seeing across the world. And they do appear to provide one of the very few policy tools that can provide relief at something resembling the pace that is needed in order to support informal livelihoods in these days. However, needless to say, there also appear to be enormous implementation challenges. We've frequently seen governments build payment uh, targeting on pre-existing social welfare registries, which don't precisely map upon the population of informal workers. At the same time, efforts to kind of more quickly register informal workers uh, face a variety of issues from accessibility to the, the future use of this data. And crucially, we think that there is also a long run aspect of these relief efforts that will affect informal economies and that is now frequently overlooked. And that lies in the medium term fiscal relationships between states and informal economies. Once the kind of dust settles on this first wave of health and economic relief efforts in this pandemic, countries around the globe will find themselves with severe fiscal deficits and expanding public debt. Particularly in the global south, the tax bases of many countries are relatively narrow, 
And we think that it's quite likely that broadening the tax base through extracting revenue from the informal sector might again become a policy priority. Not going to outline all the issues around taxing the informal economy here, but just note that particularly in a context where these efforts are driven by a need for revenue extraction, there are enormous risks that they will lead to further marginalization, harassment, the overtaxation of small businesses that are already paying a large range of, of formal and informal fees and taxes. There are huge challenges ahead, both in the, in the short and the long term. And with that, I will head over to Vanessa. Great. Thanks, Max. Uh, so as Max has highlighted, we know that the effects of COVID-19 are unequal. While the virus itself may not discriminate, the underlying inequities embedded in social, economic, and political structures mean that the impact of both the virus and the containment measures are affecting different populations differently, with particularly devastating impacts for vulnerable populations uh, and workers in the informal sector. So in addition to talking more today about the impact for the informal economy and informal sector workers, uh, we also want to open a discussion about the role that research may play in supporting policy responses, both during the crisis and in the post-crisis recovery period. Uh, at the ICTD, we've begun to discuss these potential roles for research uh, more broadly. Uh, we've been you know, focusing our discussion on, on three key points that, um, that I, hope we can, uh, we, I hope we can broaden that discussion today. Um, so first, you know, we've been thinking just in general about the challenges of how to go about collecting data in the time of social distancing and, and lockdowns. Um, these are uh, raises questions and about how to access research participants safely, um, introduces new challenges of, of, of conducting things like mobile phone surveys um, and ensuring a representative sample when doing so, uh, recognizing uh, in particular that mobile phone ownership and internet access is inequitable and, and often gendered within communities and within households. Um, the second point uh, that we've been discussing is how, uh, how existing or ongoing data collection can be adapted to address uh, pressing data needs. Um, so including thinking about how uh, existing sampling frames can, can feasibly and ethically be used to track the impacts of the global pandemic to, to better target relief and responses. Uh, but this, of course, presents particular challenges for focusing on the impacts uh, on the informal sector, um, as, as often these sampling frames, uh, existing surveys simply don't exist. Uh, so we've been thinking about how we can go about working uh, with local partners, including, including organizations like informal labor unions, uh, to better capture workers in the informal sector, uh, to reach people that are often hidden uh, or not included in, in government registration uh, processes. Uh, and third, uh, we've been thinking about how research outputs can link to and support uh, policymakers and advocacy organizations more quickly and more directly. So not just thinking about the academic outputs of research, not just thinking about the paper that may be published in a year or three years or five years, who knows, but, but thinking about how we can make data available on a close to real time basis to policymakers, to advocacy uh, organizations and to stakeholders uh, to inform, to better inform evidence based responses to the crisis and to target relief efforts more effectively and equitably. So we've been thinking uh, about what that means in terms of in terms of partnering with policymakers and local organizations and, and making data available to them, accessible to them, and more relevant. So that includes ensuring that we're asking uh, policy policy relevant and useful questions. Uh, so these are some of the key points that Max and I and the rest of the team at the ICTD have begun to think about in terms of the effects of COVID nineteen. Uh, the relief responses and, uh, and the role of research uh, at this time. Uh, so I'm not going to waste any more time. I'd like to pass the floor to our panelists to share their thoughts uh, about these different elements, about the impacts on the informal economy, uh, the effectiveness of existing policy responses, or, or the type of relief efforts that would be more appropriate, uh, and the challenges or opportunities for, for research to support policy and advocacy at this time. Uh, in terms of formats, we're very lucky to have four wonderful panelists today. Uh, they'll each be giving about 10 minutes uh, to present. Uh, 
Uh, we will be holding all questions until the end of the presentations, after which we will be opening the floor uh, to, to a broader discussion. So if you have questions, uh, we'll ask that you uh, follow these protocols. So if you're on Zoom, we'll ask that you uh, note in the chat or raise your, I think there's a virtual uh, hand function that you can, you can raise your hand um, to note that you would like to speak, or you can pose the question directly in the chat and we'll make sure that it's addressed. Uh, if you're joining us by YouTube, you also have the opportunity to include questions or comments in the chat function there. We'll be monitoring that chat to make sure that you are included in the discussion. Uh, if you're leaving comments or questions in the chat, uh, we'll just ask that you identify yourself and your affiliation so that we know who we're talking to. Uh, and we'll remind everyone uh, to keep themselves on mute if they're not speaking. And, uh, and we'll note that we are uh, recording the proceedings so that everyone is aware of that. So our first panelist today, we're, we're very excited to have her with us today, uh, is, is Kate Marr. She is an Associate Professor in Development Studies at the London School of Economics. She's published extensively on the informal economy, on non-state governance in Africa. She has particular expertise in Nigeria. Uh, she's a, a leading figure in the field and we're, we're very uh, excited to have her perspectives on, on all of these issues. So thank you, Kate. I will hand the floor to you. Hey, thanks very much. And thanks, uh, Max and Vanessa, for putting together this, this interesting roundtable. Um, it's particularly timely for me because this is coming right at the end of uh, my option course in the Department of International Development at the LSE on the informal economy and development. Uh, so many of my students who had the last few weeks of their teaching um, virtually will have an opportunity to pull together some of the issues that they, they've learned. And with that in mind, I decided to pull together my comments um, through the framework of um, one of the, the issues we look at at the course, which is a, a framework devised by WeGo, which they call the three Vs, visibility, validity, and voice. And I thought that might be a useful way of thinking about what the coronavirus um, incident uh, is, is making us see about the informal economy and what we are still not seeing very well, or the, the different ways in which what is coming to our attention also occludes uh, other things from our attention. Um, I'm going to try a little bit of fancy footwork. I want to see if I can show a little video clip, uh, but we'll, we'll see how that works technically. This has been a great time of learning by doing electronically, since I am not a huge fan of electronic teaching. Um, but uh, on the, the issue of visibility, I think all of us have noticed that there are many ways in which uh, the coronavirus context is really changing the visibility of the informal economy. Suddenly it's on the policy uh, agenda, uh, government is talking about it, labor unions are talking about it, uh, we are more aware than ever of gig workers, of informal workers, as something that is on the news regularly and in policy discussions and raised by the opposition, which is not, especially in the UK, something we ever really uh, expected to see, at least not now. So WeGo focuses very much on the idea of visibility of the informal economy, and they tend to speak, at it in, speak of it in terms of statistics, making the informal economy statistically visible. But what we're seeing now is a growing political visibility. Uh, the implications of the informal economy for um, how we react to uh, coronavirus um, is, are, are becoming much more politically visible. But it's interesting to note that the informal economy and informal workers are becoming visible not because of the risks that informality poses to informal workers, but because of the risks that informality poses to formal workers, to us, to the mainstream society. Informal actors and their vulnerability has become a risk to us in terms of our ability to um, control the spread of this virus because it is difficult for them to sit at home when they have to earn an income every day. So it's important to note, I think, that the um, the reason that we're looking at the informal economy and so interested in the informal economy, the reason that it has become politically of interest, is because suddenly their vulnerability, which has posed a risk to them for 
decades, uh, if not longer, now poses a risk to mainstream society. Um, there's also an increasing social visibility taking place as the inability of informal actors to, um, to deal with lockdown conditions is forcing them out into the streets because in many cases they must work every day if they're going to eat, um, because of the risky lives that they lead and their need to seek safer conditions. And let me just uh, try and see if my technical skills are adequate to see the, the task here. I want to share clip with Susie here. a little clip from a Nigerian uh, news story. Okay, so many of us have been seeing stories about how uh, people in the informal economy in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia are saying, what we fear here is hunger. Yes, coronavirus is a risk, but we face risks to our health all the time. We live unstable, unhealthy lives. What we fear is hunger. What we fear is intensified insecurity. So their own risk assessment is quite different from the kinds of risk assessment that are coming on the policy radar. And uh, I have another screen here. Um, just a, a little, little background. Um, Kate? We really sorry to interrupt you. Um, we couldn't hear the video earlier. So if there's another thing with audio, that might be a bit of a challenge. Okay. All right. Um, you couldn't hear that video. Uh, no. Okay. All right. Maybe I better, better leave it then. Well, that's a shame. Okay. It was a clip of a, a, um, a, a person in the informal economy in Nigeria on the street side saying he cannot stay at home. There's no point in trying to uh, stay at home when what you fear is hunger and ask anybody here what they fear is hunger. Okay, so the, the, the key issue here is that what is happening is not only that we are, the informal economy is politically visible, but in ways that obscure the real risks that they feel they face. The key risk for them is hunger and insecurity. The key risk for us is the risk that informality poses to our own, house, our own health. In India, we see informal actors that are increasingly extruded into the streets as they find, uh, try to find a way to deal with a reality that is made absolutely insupportable through lockdown. Lockdown has been impossible for large numbers of informal actors. Um, and we also are seeing a new issue that is just beginning to emerge in which one of the main sources of support and solace to which informal actors turn the church, the mosque, is part of what's being locked down in many societies. Um, evangelical Christians and some Islamic groups are still continuing to hold mass meetings, in some cases because they've been exempted from lockdowns in Brazil, in Kenya, and in other cases because they overtly defy lockdowns, uh, such as in the, the US. And that may create a more nefarious type of visibility for informal actors, the visibility of religious targeting, which we're seeing in India now, as Muslims are being increasingly targeted as sources of spreading coronavirus, but also as um, deliberately spreading it. It's being billed as a form of, of secret jihad. Um, and we all know that these, this kind of religious targeting tends to fall hardest on people in informal settlements. Now, the second issue is the issue of validity. Validity is about the legal recognition of informal workers as valid workers, as legally uh, protected workers who deserve the protection not only of uh, social welfare protection, but the state. 
one of the things that coronavirus has done is it's changed our understanding of essential work. Suddenly, taxis have become much more essential when public transport is shut down. Migrant fruit and vegetable pickers in the UK have become viewed as, as much more essential now that they can't travel in from, from Europe. Street vendors and open market traders are essential because that are, they represent core elements in the food supply chain, not only for uh, the people in, in slums and poor areas, but also for large segments of the middle classes in many African countries. Temporary health workers are being uh, regarded as essential as doctors and more formally employed workers are um, forced into self-isolation or even worse. But we often see here a form of recognition of informal work and informal workers and gig, gig workers as essential in a way that is more affective rather than material, the kind of clapping for the NHS but not doing anything about their salaries and, and working conditions. Uh, and the reality is that the material effects of the pandemic are still uh, falling hardest on the poor. The kinds of so support me measures that uh, Max mentioned um, uh, often ignore the, the lack of documentation of many informal workers, the fact that they don't have tax records to show their, their lack of uh, various types of um, appearance on regulatory registers, so that even when they're politically recognized, the infrastructure to reach them is more problematic. Um, there's also the uh, problem that the validity of their work and their need for basic uh, social support is recognized. But in fact, the, um, the validity of them as workers, the validity of their need for sustainable forms of in income um, is uh, not recognized by the very law that is supposed to uh, accord that validity. And you have in India and Nigeria, um, increasing situations of large numbers of informal workers being interred in crowded slums and uh, uh, camps, uh, being punished and beaten by police when they try to go out and collect, uh, look for work or find a, a safer place to be, so that they are most exposed to the recriminations of police, to the violence of police, whereas middle-class actors can often drive to the village, drive to their holiday homes, with uh, perhaps a, a moderate amount of recrimination, but certainly no physical punishment, no fines, uh, no the, the, the kind of um, severe uh, lack of validity that informal actors face uh, really doesn't fall on middle, middle class actors who do similar kinds of things. And finally, the issue of voice. We are um, Sorry to really briefly interrupt you before you get to the final point. Could you unshare your screen so we can see you again? Sorry. Um, um, all right. Um, I cannot see how my screen is. Oh, stop share. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, fantastic. Thank you. Okay. The, the final point is that I had a, um, a small PowerPoint, but since the first thing didn't work, it's better just to leave it. Um, so the, the, the final issue is the issue of voice. There are many organizations, advocacy groups, labor unions that are struggling to keep the needs of informal actors on the agenda to specify the specific needs when um, support is rolled out to the self-employed and doesn't reach the informal economy to, to raise the issues of how this fails to read, reach gig workers and what needs to be done. Um, pushing for emergency food distribution, for including soap and water in the kinds of provisions made to slums. All of these things are more on the agenda, the kinds of immediate emergency needs that are there. Um, we also have an increasing pressure for universal basic income in India, in South Africa, in Canada, variations, variants of it in the UK. Um, but Thinking about what these emergency measures mean is what's not quite coming through in political voice. Um, the push for a universal basic income, uh, in, in many ways, it's not entirely taking on board the ways in which universal basic incomes can be used to marginalize the debate about workers' rights. Once you give them the basic income, the workers' rights issue is, is less thought about. 
Uh, Donald Trump, for example, as mentioned by Laura Alfers in some recent uh, WeGo blogs, was uh, proposing to excuse workers from uh, making their social welfare contributions uh, through the employment uh, uh, context in order to put more immediate money in their pockets, but that will starve the wider social welfare systems of funds in the process of putting money in, in people's uh, pockets. Uh, Mahila Housing Trust is um, trying to shift the focus not just from emergency social measures, but also putting the health concerns of informal actors on the, the agenda. Sanitation, social distancing, training in slums, how to adapt lockdown protocols to the real situations in which people live and help them work out ways when they can't get masks and they can't uh, um, live in ways that don't involve crowding people into rooms and they do have to queue for things. How to make those kinds of health provisions uh, adaptable and workable in the situations in which they operate. Um, but I think it's worth putting on the agenda that this mobiliz mobilization largely around emergency social protection measures, occasionally around emergency health measures, um, is taking our eye off the real ball, and that is the ball of labor rights. WeGo's work with informal workers to deal with immediate needs, I think, is really important, and it's really important to put on the agenda the actual immediate needs of informal workers rather than measures that aim to reach informal workers but actually fail to do so. But there are longer term labor rights issues, the material recognition of the uh, unstable, uh, insecure context in which informal actors are increasingly working. Um, and these informal actors increasingly woven into the production systems and the value chains and the distribution systems and the social services that we all use. Um, and I, th I think it would be useful to think about the ways in which just as business is looking at how they're going to turn this crisis into an opportunity. Those who are articulating the political voice of informal actors, informal workers, organizations, labor unions, uh, advocacy groups, need really importantly to think about how informal advocates can turn this crisis into an opportunity. To keep our eye on the ball, to think politically about the real risks that informal actors are concerned about rather than the more um, immediate emergency risks that will then disappear once the pandemic has passed. And to think about whether our focus should be on universal basic income, should be on labor rights, should be on the status of uh, self-employed and gig workers as workers, um, and about the legal validity and legal protection that goes along with that. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Kate. That was that was a really wonderful start to this conversation. Uh, your framework of, of visibility, validity, and voice, or WeGo's framework that you're using, is is really useful for thinking about um, what the distractions are, what the noise is, and and what how we can actually focus on on what matters. So that's a really useful, really useful point. Some really interesting points too about you know the contradictions between uh, funding uh, emergency measures and focusing on emergency measures at the expense of financing or supporting sustainable welfare systems uh, and thinking about um, the contradictions between the priorities of the informal sector uh, versus mainstream society and, and policymakers. So that's a really, really interesting start. Um, next in our uh, presentations today, we have uh, uh, Rachel Moussier, who is the Deputy Director of the Social Protection Program at Riego. Uh, and for those that don't know, Riego stands for a Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. Uh, it's a global network focused on securing livelihoods for the working poor in the informal economy with a particular focus on women. Um, now, Rachel has been leading Riego's rapid appraisal uh, of the situation for uh, informal workers. So we're particularly excited to hear what she has to say about that process. So Rachel, over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you very much to you, Vanessa, and to Max for organizing this. And Kate, thank you for, for opening up this discussion. Um, I think you've uh, captured, I mean, certainly, 
some of our key issues around the three Vs, but I'm going to take this time and I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can see my a quick, there we go. Um, let me know if you can see that. Yeah. Yep. Great. All right. So um, as Vanessa said, we have just done a, a rapid assessment. Um, hold on one second. So we've just done a, a rapid assessment of um, informal workers, uh, the impact of both the health crisis and the economic crisis on informal workers. And in this presentation, I'm gonna look at the key findings from the rapid assessment, and then look at some of the emergency relief responses um, and their inclusion or exclusion of informal workers. Some of this has been touched on, so I won't spend too much on time on this. And then um, conclude with some research and advocacy priorities for informal workers organizations. So the rapid assessment was conducted between the 23rd of March to the 8th of April. Um, we just published the results, uh, or at least a sort of brief of the results uh, yesterday on the website. Um, it was interviews with, it included interviews with 21 national or local member-based organizations, uh, five regional and global networks of informal workers organizations, and all of this across Africa, Asia, and Latin America, as well as uh, uh, home net East, Eastern Europe, so that would also be included here. WeGo focuses on four sectors uh, within the informal economy. We look at domestic workers, home-based workers, street vendors and market traders, and waste pickers. And so the rapid assessment was focused in these sectors. Um, the reason for this uh, focus is that uh, we find that women are disproportionately represented in these sectors, and they're also incredibly vulnerable sectors within the informal economy. So the rapid assessment, um, and there's a link in the PowerPoint that can also be shared uh, on, the, on the Zoom chat, is that we looked at the public health measures and their impact on uh, informal workers and their livelihoods. We did ask questions around health um, and the potential health impacts to informal workers, but at the time that this rapid assessment was done, many of our members were not yet feeling the health impacts, neither were they themselves experiencing um, uh, sort of COVID-19 symptoms, nor were their households, were as anyone in their households directly touched yet. There were some incidents, but it was very much um, marginal at this stage. We expect that to change, sadly. Um, so just some key findings. The first is that we often think of the impacts in terms of the semi-lockdown or the, the full lockdowns, but actually many of the impacts to informal workers' livelihoods have been felt since January in some sectors. So in um, Southeast Asia, home-based workers have been seeing the price of their raw materials increase as soon as China announced their lockdown. Um, they've seen a, a, a fall in their profits. Um, they've seen a partial loss of income lead, that finally materialized into a total loss of income. Uh, we've also seen that in the waste picking sector, the price of recyclable materials, uh, be it plastic, cardboard, glass, has plummeted. And, and that's due to the lockdown both in China, but also that then spread to Europe and North America. Finally, um, coming back to home-based workers within supply chains, uh, particularly in the garment sector, once Europe and North America, and as well as China, um, stopped their contracts with uh, in the garment sector, particularly in, in Southeast Asia and in South Asia, home-based workers lost a source of, uh, a source of work, um, a, a demand for their work. We also saw domestic workers being blocked out of Hong Kong and Malaysia, so many migrant workers not be able, being able to return uh, to their employers. So I, I think what we, we see here is that by the time that public health measures are in place, many informal workers had already lost uh, 
either a part of their income or a have, are experiencing a total loss of income. The other key finding is that we are not talking about a temporary loss of income. Uh, informal workers understand this as a permanent loss of income. And this is, this is clear across all four sectors. And just to give you a few examples of what we mean here. Um, in India, we've seen that the government has used the lockdown to break up street vending infrastructure, which means that once the lockdown is lifted, street vendors won't be able to come back to those, to those spaces that they had negotiated and, and gained from the municipality. We've seen police harassment, as Kate mentioned, uh, across all regions, and that's led to evidently physical abuse, but also to confiscation of goods, which therefore has implications for starting up work uh, once that is possible. In Colombia, waste pickers have said that they are taking great risks on um, great health risks by continuing to work, even without the protective gear that they need to, um, in order to retain their control over the recyclables so that private companies don't come in and take over the, take over their areas of work and take over the procurement contracts that they have they've been given. Um, domestic workers were the first to talk about um, employers losing their incomes and, and having no guarantee that they'll be able to return to work. And I think this is really important and it links to Kate's point around emergency response versus sort of long-term responses and how do we think about labor rights, how do we think about social protection within this context, is that income support has tended to be, has been characterized by governments as a short-term, sometimes one-off measure. Um, but the response needs to be, but social protection and cash transfers need to be an integral, integral part of recovery packages. The final key finding that I want to highlight is that um, there's been evidence of increased care work for women informal workers. And again, this is across all four sectors. Um, for domestic workers, there's been an increase in paid care work, live-in domestic workers in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia have seen that their employers <laughs> are now all at home. Uh, so their employers' children are also all at home. So they're, um, they obviously have an increase in, in their workloads and they're no longer able to leave the house at any point due to the lockdowns. Um, for in other sectors, um, or for women in other sectors, we've seen that their unpaid care work has significantly increased. And this started actually even before the lockdowns. This started, for instance, in Africa, uh, before lockdowns were announced um, in Kenya or in Tanzania, schools were shut. And so once schools were shut, it, mean, it meant that women informal workers have been amongst the first to lose incomes. And because of their continued unpaid care responsibilities, until there's access to uh, schools again and also daycare services, they're most likely to be the last ones to get back into, into work. And there's also a very high likelihood, as we've seen in other crises, that they will be pushed into the more vulnerable forms of informal work. So domestic workers who are waged informal workers are already saying to us that they're looking for self-employed opportunities within the informal economy, either through street vending, but that's much more, or that can be much more precarious. So that's certainly something that we are seeing. In terms of the emergency relief um, and tracking uh, sort of the impact on informal workers, I want to say that uh, we have started uh, on our website, there's a sort of Google Doc that is um, where we're consistently updating and tracking the, the social protection measures, but particularly the cash transfers that are accessible to informal workers. Um, we've talked, there's already been mention of digital and financial exclusion. I don't have much time to go into that, but I, I just want to add that there's been an, an exclusion of less visible workers, particularly domestic workers and home-based workers, because they're in private homes. And because much of this work is women's work and gendered and therefore not visible. So um, that's, that's certainly been something that we've seen in terms of which informal workers are eligible and, and which are not. Essential workers, um, 
Kate made reference to this, we are seeing that um, some informal workers are increasingly recognized, such as food producers and vendors and waste pickers. Uh, for instance, South Africa closed, initially closed down all of its markets at the start of its lockdown, but decided to then two weeks later to allow some uh, food vendors to operate again because they're so critical to food distribution systems. Um, but there are also essential workers who are unrecognized. Um, so live in domestic workers who I've mentioned, home-based workers who are uh, stitching masks uh, and providing much needed ma face masks at the moment within the local market and for their communities. There's also very little discussion around the fact that many of these essential workers, be they formal sector workers or informal sector workers, require childcare. Uh, in order to operate, and what of the childcare providers, uh, given that daycare centers have, have been closed. Um, of evidently, the, the battle that in terms of an, an immediate response is around ensuring that essential workers that um, are, are categorized as essential workers, uh, that's certainly one of the, the areas that we're looking at, and also that they have access to protective health measures and protective gear. Uh, the rapid appraisal um, sort of led or from the rapid appraisal emerged these guiding principles. These aren't new for WeGo, but I think, I think it's worth noting when we think about our next steps in terms of research and advocacy, particularly not only for informal workers, but with informal workers. And in that respect, I'm going to focus on the last point, um, honor nothing for us without us. And what we've seen already on the ground is that informal workers organizations are negotiating with governments in terms of uh, the design of um, cash transfer programs to make sure that they're included. This was the case in Thailand, in South Africa. Um, we've also seen that they're critical in the delivery and relief of and uh, recovery measures, not just emergency, but in terms of substantiating the databases in terms of um, for cash transfers. Governments don't have this information. They're going to informal workers organizations, asking them for their list of members because in the case of street vendors, for, for instance, not all of them are registered. Um, so even if they operate within a market. Um, however, they may be visible in informal workers uh, membership. So, but I think I wanna, I wanna stress here that this raises an opportunity and also a challenge, as Kate's mentioned, around social dialogue. Um, cash transfers, in the way that they, they're not negotiated by definition, unlike social insurance schemes, which are or have tended to be negotiated through tripartite structures amongst uh, it within the formal sector by government employers and uh, formal sector workers. Um, social assistance doesn't have those inbuilt social dialogue measures. And actually, this does pose a risk for us because to what extent, you know, can we, uh, we can, I have I identify these examples, but we also have to work in broader coalitions. And I think that's, that's emerging already through the rapid assessment. Um, in Thailand, the informal workers organizations that are part of the WeGo network have been collaborating with trade unions, but also sort of civil society organizations working on poverty alleviation. Um, and I think broader coalitions, because we don't have that institutional power uh, as informal workers organizations, uh, must be drawn on to, to ensure that cash transfers uh, are embedded in social dialogue. I think in terms of the next um, research and advocacy priorities, um, we will be doing a next round of rapid assessments in, in two months time. I think we are expecting to see, um, unfortunately, more of a health impact uh, as um, COVID continues to spread. Um, I think that the, the other issue that came out strongly was the desire to, across the WeGo network, was to develop a sort of livelihoods recovery and resilience framework. And, and that's really about being prepared for, for the deliver, the, the re economic recovery packages that will be emerging now. What do, what do they say about formalization? What is our position on formalization? We've developed this as we go already, but how do we 
how do we present this within and, um, and take this forward in discussions around economic recovery packages? I think the other thing is around the extension of social protection programs beyond the emergency period. And of course, the link between social protection and access to public care services, and particularly healthcare and childcare, have emerged as key um, areas in terms of our next steps in our advocacy. Um, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think I'm out of time, but thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. That was really useful. Thank you so much for sharing that, that data and the ongoing research. It's so useful to have a sense of the experiences across the global context and then the diversity of places that you collected that information, but also the diversity within the informal sector. So recognizing that certain sectors and certain trades are going to be affected uh, differently. And also thinking about the, the longer term impact, right? So not just how this affects people in the short term, but the long term. So that's really wonderful. We really appreciate that. Um, our third panelist today uh, is Umar Javed, who is an assistant professor at the Lahore University of Management Sciences. He is a sociologist that focuses on politics, developments, and urban informality in South Asia. So we're particularly interested to hear his perspective of the impacts of COVID-19 on the informal economy from a South Asian perspective. Uh, from what I understand, he's also an avid football and cricket fan. And Twitter tells me that he shares my birthday. So I will cede the floor to a fellow Leo. Uh, thank you, uh, Vanessa. Thank you, Max, for putting this together. It's great to be here. Uh, and obviously, some really important uh, points have already been made uh, by Kate uh, and Rachel. I think uh, I just wanted to sort of, uh, so for my 10 minutes, what I'll do is, is I wanted to focus on uh, the case that I'm looking at in more detail, which is Pakistan, which is where I'm based. Um, and see how some of the factors that have already been identified in the discussion so far, in particular factors related to sort of long-term recovery, factors related to the visibility of the informal sector on the political and the socioeconomic agenda, but also uh, factors related to the voice and how uh, that uh, a voice of the informal sector and obviously particular segments within the informal sector and the impact that it has on, on outcomes. So I have a presentation that, I, uh, that I'll sort of just quickly go through. Some of it is, uh, is I guess, it, it's... Uh, it's uh, not that uh, you know important as far as sort of these larger points are concerned, but I thought I'd uh, sort of set the stage um, as far as uh, sort of uh, you know the Pakistan case in particular is concerned. Is this uh, is it visible? You can Max, if you can just nod if the screen is if the presentation is visible or not. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so uh, basically uh, what we're looking at here in 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 the case of Pakistan in particular is uh, sort of a. a significant impact on the informal sector and, and part of the reason is that the informal sector uh, is uh, and the way that the informal sector is defined in Pakistan is, is obviously we're looking at self-employed or own account workers, casually employed laborers and apprentices and owners and employees in smaller micro enterprises. Um, and I think one of the important things uh, that the numbers tell us is, is the distribution, both the sectoral distribution and the occupational distribution of the informal sector, because that I think has strong implications for how the virus and obviously the effects of the virus and the uh, the public health measures that have been taken around the virus, how they impact uh, the informal sector um, as a whole. Um, so for uh, so for uh, for Pakistan, we're looking at about 72% of the total non-farm uh, workforce is informally employed, and the trend has been pretty much consistent for the last decade. In terms of absolute numbers, we're looking at about 27 million uh, individuals or 27 million earners, um, and uh, this would, I mean, in, in terms of the number of households in the country. Uh, who are in some form or the other associated with informal work, we're looking at a, a, at sort of greater than maybe 50% of all households. Uh, and of these 27 million, we'll see about 13 million uh, residing in major urban localities. Um, by uh, employment status, uh, about 47.5% are employees. Uh, so they're working in uh, other sort of informally organized businesses, mostly those businesses which aren't uh, registered with tax, social security, uh, or uh, municipal authorities. And then we have about 45% of this, or 11 million, uh, are own account workers, uh, which uh, obviously are the self-employed category uh, that is often used in other country contexts. Um, what I think is quite telling, though, is as far as uh, uh, the subject that we're looking at is the sectoral and occupational distribution of the informal sector. And this is pretty common across, I think, a number of country contexts. So Pakistan isn't unique in the way that you see a pretty significant concentration of the informal sector workforce in wholesale and retail trade, in small scale uh, sort of manufacturing, 
uh, in the construction sector, in transportation, but also, uh, and this is, I think, quite tied to urbanization, in things like community social and personal services. So this would include, so for example, domestic help, uh, care workers, uh, 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 people associated with the waste economy. And that is also reflected largely in the way that the occupation structures uh, operate within the informal sector uh, workforce. The um, impact so far that we're looking at, um, so I mean, there are obviously uh, two broad uh, streams of impact. One is obviously the public health risks that are associated with the virus itself. Um, I think we're looking at informality in, in, in two different ways. So there's informality and economic precarity, but there's also sort of informality in terms of the spatial spread uh, and where the informal sector workforce actually, uh, you will find them in, in major cities, right? So about 45.5% of urban residents in Pakistan live in fairly densely populated informal settlements. And there's a, there are pre-existing baseline health conditions or health and sanitation conditions that make these uh, areas quite uh, sort of um, precarious as it is. And um, a lot of these issues are then sort of, uh, one would say that they would escalate um, in the case of sort of transmission. And we've already had uh, several uh, cases of, of uh, you know, fairly uh, significant transmission or local community-based transmission of the virus uh, happening in these informal settlements. So I think that's a that's a real health risk, which I think um, is isn't being talked enough about. Uh, I think that's uh, really that in itself tells you something about the way that the conversation is happening around public health in in a number of countries. Uh, and I think what is sort of being considered in a little more detail is the socioeconomic fallout of some of the public health interventions that are taken. So in Pakistan, we've experienced sort of a lockdown, a stage two lockdown, uh, pretty much for the last month or so. And that's directly impacted uh, the informal sector in a number of ways, largely because stage two lockdowns include uh, the shutdown of uh, intercity, intracity public transportation, includes the shutdown of the, uh, of, of the construction sector, of the manufacturing sector. Um, and uh, non-essential wholesale retail as well. So, non so any any business that doesn't sell uh, sort of essential items or groceries or, or, or medical goods, they've basically been uh, shut down uh, over the preceding three months. Um, some preliminary interviews with people uh, who work in a large marketplaces, mostly wholesale marketplaces, have already confirmed the extensive dislocation of street vendors, uh, hawkers, and migrant labor. So that goes back to this earlier point that a lot of the existing informal uh, uh, retail infrastructure is also being uh, sort of, uh, sort of it's being displaced in this time period when lockdowns are in place. Uh, we were also seeing some uh, level of, um, uh, of repressive action on part of state authorities to enforce the lockdown, uh, which really is, and the debate, uh, I think in, in Pakistan's case, has, has sort of, it, it's come back to this larger point about whether uh, you know we can uh, whether the country can actually afford a lockdown or what that means for obviously livelihoods and um, and people's subsistence, right? And uh, the some estimates or initial estimates uh, that we see uh, in terms of uh, sort of the number affected uh, in terms of an income shock are about 11 million earners. So that's about one third of the of the non-farm labor force in the country. But obviously, I think this is a this is a fairly low estimate. The actual estimate would probably be uh, would be much much higher. Um, I think one last point that that I think deserves mentioning is just the precarity that uh, lockdowns have generally created uh, for migrant labor for migrant labor in particular because uh, you've also shut down uh, public transportation uh, you've shut down other modes of transport uh, you know informal for example transportation services and many are stranded in uh, places of work uh, or in uh, temporary uh, residences where uh, you know in urban centers and haven't had don't have the resources to uh, sort of travel back. Uh, or to even afford taxis, for example, that can take them back to, uh, you know, the rural or very urban centers uh, where they actually came from. Um, I think this is, uh, I'll just sort of uh, briefly go over this. I think this, uh, some of the existing vulnerability indicators really show how the informal sector uh, is, is the one that uh, bears the brunt of, 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 of these sorts of, uh, of, of the virus itself and some of the fallout that's taken place. Because if you look at the vulnerability and where it's concentrated, it's usually in places like wholesale and retail trade. Uh, in, um, uh, uh, in in hotels and restaurants, transportation uh, in particular, and I think that's uh, that's that's really sort of become quite clear, categorical from from Pakistan's case as well. Uh, so, what have been uh, some of the responses? I'll, I'll quickly go over uh, what the government has been thinking about what what they've done so far. Uh, so, as uh, Max I think mentioned at the start, uh, Pakistan's strategy is pretty much in line with what we've seen in 81 other countries. Uh, so we, you know, the Gentilini uh, Social Protection Appendix is put up 
143 social protection programs that use cash transfers um, in across 81 countries, and that's Pakistan's primary intervention here as well. So we're looking at about a cash transfer program of $870 million. Um, the disbursement to date is about 110 million. We're looking at a total of 12 million beneficiaries, so one per household, and they receive about $73 million. So it's a one-off, it's a one-off payment of $73 that's supposed to last them for four months. Um, and it's an expansion of an existing uh, cash transfer scheme that already uh, that, that's been in place for the last uh, decade or so. And the uh, and there are a number of issues with that. And I think uh, it, it's worth sort of going into details is, is that if you're if many countries are pushing cash transfer programs, then are we are we sort of even clear about what cash transfer programs, uh, who are cash transfer programs actually targeting? Uh, what are they basing this particular strategy on? And whether they're actually reaching out to populations that are uh, the most impacted by this virus. Uh, some other interventions that have been taken are, um, there's a small scale cash for tree plantation public works program. Again, it's very localized. Um, and doesn't uh, sort of reach out to an, a sufficient number of people. Uh, there's some food ration distribution through web-based enrollment. And there is, uh, interestingly enough, there's a lot of conversation on easing uh, lockdown restrictions on the construction sector, uh, because that's a, a major source of employing daily wage laborers and, and the informal sector workforce as a whole, uh, and businesses that are linked to it. And that's a conversation that, that's been happening um, these days as well. So, uh, and finally, the last, I think, response that we've seen is utility bill deferment, which I think is probably the most, one of the more creative ways of, of uh, reaching out to uh, workers who might otherwise be excluded from existing uh, poverty databases. And how, what are the gaps uh, in particular as far as these, um, these measures are concerned? I think uh, poverty databases are replete with exclusion errors. Uh, this is especially true uh, for urban migrant workers. Um, and I think uh, the analysis of Pakistan's case uh, shows that poverty estimates are largely biased towards rural areas due to the characteristics that are involved in the composite index that is created. The composite index usually has higher uh, provisions for asset scores, um, and uh, many informal sector workers might actually have a basic asset such as a motorcycle or uh, a, a television at home or a refrigerator in, in their place of residence. Uh, but which means that they automatically score a little higher on these on these sorts of of, uh, of poverty assessments. Uh, but what poverty assessments are actually not uh, particularly sensitive to are sudden income shocks, and income shocks uh, such as the one that we are currently experiencing would push uh, quite a few people, uh, you know, beyond the uh, obviously uh, into precarious conditions in, in particular for subsistence related issues. Similarly, there are other issues. There's an extensive reliance on self-enrollment, especially of people who already hold national identity cards. Uh, people are supposed to send SMSs or enroll themselves through web portals. Again, internet access is not uh, universal. Uh, broadband penetration is in fact high. So really some of these strategies need to be better thought out. And I think uh, that really brings us to the last point here, which is of voice and visibility uh, of, of the informal sector in various country contexts, right? And Rachel and, and we go have generally talked about how uh, there are sort of informal sector organizations that can be taken on board uh, as far as decision-making is concerned, right? But what happens in country contexts where there are no collective, uh, there is no collective action among informal sector workers, or there's very sort of localized or diffuse collective action, right? What happens in places where you don't have uh, uh, sort of the existing associational uh, or requisite associational infrastructure required to actually link up uh, the, the current experiences of vulnerabilities that are encountered by the informal sector uh, and, and sort of translate that to the government itself. I mean, in Pakistan's case, I think it's particularly clear that the biggest stimulus effort of about $8 billion that we're currently seeing is biased towards the formal sector and the bank population. So I think, uh, I think the voice part is, in, is particularly important, and I think it speaks to key longstanding political economy constraints uh, that the informal uh, economy faces. Um, and I think uh, that this is an opportunity in some ways to actually broaden the conversation uh, and to sort of revisit some of the social protection legacies that usually are biased towards employment in formal sector firms are, or are sort of simply biased towards uh, bigger, more better organized actors. So what do we do about countries where the informal sector is largely unorganized or is or doesn't have the same kind of political voice, right? So um, I'll, uh, I'll leave it at, uh, at that. Um, but I think uh, just the last point here would be that I think while a lot of the responses that we see are quite universal, um, you know, in a lot of countries, are, there's an isomorphism in almost in terms of how uh, countries are responding to the crisis. Uh, but I think the underlying uh, exclusion errors in particular and also the, the validity 
um, uh, and and the voice aspect of of who's actually being able to contribute to these conversations. I think that is differentially distributed across different countries, and I think that's where research can possibly play a role uh, in in identifying and highlighting some of these vulnerabilities that might get missed out in the way that regular politics actually functions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. It's really interesting to hear more about the, the, the context in Pakistan, uh, particularly thinking about the vulnerabilities of different types of workers and, and some of the biases that may embed, be embedded within responses and how that may uh, you know, relate to comparative context. So thank you so much for that. I will now move to our, our final panelist, uh, Gerard McCarthy. He is a postdoctoral fellow at the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. Uh, he uh, has done extensive research on political institutions, on, on market reform and inequality in Myanmar. Uh, and I know that he's been thinking deeply about how to go about setting up research projects to track the socioeconomic and political consequences of COVID, particularly in thinking about the trade-offs between uh, containing the virus uh, without worsening economic precarity for informal sector workers. So Gerard, I will uh, hand the floor to you. Um, thank you, uh, Vanessa. Thank you to, to Max and thank you to um, the Institute for, um, uh, ICTD um, for hosting me for this, um, this seminar and bringing us all together. This has been tremendously productive um, to just hear the, the whole range of, of different um, experiences and, and um, the consequences of COVID as it's been processed in different, different contexts. Um, so I just want to start with this image, um, which is a group of women who have been protesting for um, paid leave. Uh, during the time that the garment um, factory has been shuttered um, in, in Yangon um, uh, and uh, um, been on strike for um, uh, a few days. Uh, and uh, I think it kind of provides an interesting insight both into how the global uh, impacts of COVID on especially garment sector workers um, uh, who are um, in this case are not entitled to any of the formal leave um, uh, schemes um, uh, in the factory that they work um, uh, have in many ways been affected before anyone else um, in terms of before the, the actual virus hitting, hitting Myanmar. Um, just to give a bit of context, um, the informal economy is estimated at about 50% of Myanmar's economy, if not uh, more. Um, uh, Myanmar's population is 53 million. Um, uh, COVID's impact on the informal economy in Myanmar um, uh, and on Myanmar more broadly arrived well before the virus actually took off in the country. So as of um, today, it's only 85 confirmed cases. Um, uh, in Myanmar and four deaths um, related to COVID. Um, but uh, as I'll mention, there's a lot of issues there in terms of the, the kind of health dimensions um, uh, of, of testing and, and, and health system capacity. Um, but from mid-March and, and um, earlier than that, um, there were very clear indicators of the impacts of COVID um, a, as a kind of global phenomenon um, uh, hitting the informal economy. Um, so uh, two uh, very clear um, uh, indicators of this was uh, migration from Thailand, the return of people from Thailand who were um, uh, fired from uh, uh, garment factories. Um, uh, so at least 300,000 people have crossed the border, um, but there are millions of um, Burmese workers in Thailand um, without any kind of formal protection. Um, and uh, there's strong uh, flows of people continuing uh, to cross that border that they have shut the formal borders, but there's been in a lot of informal border crossing that's continued in, in the last um, couple of weeks. Um, uh, obviously, a disproportionate number of those are, are women. Um, uh, the, the, these migrants have been viewed as potential vectors of disease, uh, of disease um, but there's been very little focus on their role in remitting. Um, uh, rural households, 70% um, of rural households receive remittances from abroad, um, uh, and uh, the, the rural population comprise 70% 70, 70 of Myanmar's population. So, the loss of remittances is going to be catastrophic for a lot of um, rural households over the coming months. Um, there's also been huge internal migration. Um, so villages in the Irrawaddy Delta, which were decimated in a, a major cyclone um, 12 years ago, um, uh, uh, many of those very highly affected communities, um, then uh, households migrated to Yangon in the last five, six years to take up garment sector work. And um, uh, in, in the last week, reports are that um, maybe seven out of 10 um, of families who left villages um, after that cyclone to take up uh, informal sector work um, and garment sector work in Yangon um, uh, have now returned and view that work as those returns as indefinite. I don't know when they'll be going back to take up jobs in Yangon. 
Um, so there's been this huge internal migration as well as um, international migration. And um, the early, earliest rapid surveys, which um, uh, a group that I'm working closely with called Opportunities Now in Myanmar, um, filled with a rapid survey um, uh, from the 2nd to the 5th of April, um, which found that 60% of households, um, this is a 4,000 um, uh, respondent survey um, across six cities in Myanmar, and 60% of households have lost employment and 40% of micro and small enterprises have shut it as a consequence of, um, of COVID and, and the um, demand impacts. The current policy responses, just to give you a sense, um, have been heavily health focused um, and also the heavily population control focused. Um, so the government's been making um, uh, pretty significant efforts to uh, try and expand uh, so procure PPE, expand testing and treatment capacity, um, uh, but we're dealing with an already overstretched health system um, uh, that has been starved of funding for a very long time. Um, uh, the population control dimensions, especially with the internal international migration that has been going on, has resulted in um, uh, hundreds, thousands of, of quarantine centres being established around the country. And over 50,000 people are currently in quarantine in, uh, across Myanmar uh, as of the 13th of April. Um, uh, uh, many of the state of those quarantine centres are often um, extremely poor. So the vast bulk of those people in those centres are informal economy workers who've been um, uh, dismissed or, or, or um, uh, their business is shut up and then have had to, to then migrate as a consequence. Um, there's also been lockdowns of um, uh, Myanmar's major cities, Yangon and Mandalay, um, and similar kinds of measures of different kind of variety, which have been implemented um, in state and region capitals and in, in towns across the country as well. The economic measures, as, as we sort of uh, has been a recurring theme of the, uh, the other um, presentations, um, have been heavily focused on the formal sector. Um, so the central bank has um, lowered uh, interest rates. They've announced uh, at this stage only $35 million fund to provide 1% loans for formal sector businesses. Um, and uh, there's also you know, the promise of income and personal tax remissions. Um, of course, um, Myanmar has the lowest tax to GDP ratio um, in ASEAN and one of the lowest in, in the world, um, uh, given the special size of the informal economy. Um, there have been very limited social protection actions, um, and uh, especially for informal economy workers. Um, there's been 10 day ration packs that have been distributed in the past week to those who are considered to be the most vulnerable within specific localities. Um, that budget uh, derives from the Ministry of Relief, Resettlement and Social Welfare, which is historically the least funded department in um, the ministry uh, in, in Myanmar, um, and is chronically understaffed, but also doesn't have a logistical bureaucratic presence um, below the township level. So its capacity to distribute to identify needs at a, at a local level um, uh, is, is really constrained. Um, there's also been no mention yet, um, as we've heard in, in um, uh, the last presentation, for example, um, and in other contexts, um, of expanding very limited um, skeletal apparatus of direct cash transfers in Myanmar. Um, for example, there's a, a maternal cash transfer, a um, uh, thousand day grant, um, which is given out, and a very small amount of money for um, the elderly. But those programs have not been, there's been no discussion of expanding those um, at this stage. Um, uh, so the informal economy has been massively hit. Um, and yet, paradoxically, paradoxically, it has been central to the response um, at a localised level. Um, so businesses, especially um, uh, micro and small uh, businesses, community organisations, monasteries, churches, have been playing a major role in food and aid support to those um, uh, even more vulnerable than themselves. Um, so non-state actors um, in many ways have been integrated, if not leading the local response efforts in terms of setting up quarantine centres. Um, uh, and been, uh, you know, establishing case tracing um, efforts at a, at a local level. Um, we've also seen the involvement um, of, uh, you know, local small business people, um, uh, uh, some of which may be formalised, um, but many of which uh, remain in the informal economy. Um, uh, uh, the involvement of those, those business people and community organisations on government um, uh, COVID response committees at a local level. Um, the government response um, already relies heavily on those, um, uh, those informal actors. Um, uh, for example, the government is for providing a seven day ration um, allocation for returning workers um, when they're quarantined, but they're quarantined for 21 days. Um, so uh, the government ration pack is only covering them for a third of the time that they arrive back and presumably their family and other organisations um, to take on those um, responsibilities of providing for them. Um, uh, so we see this sort of systematic reliance on community donations, charities, religious institutions, 
um, which is in reinforcing um, uh, an insecure and precarious welfare regime, which has been the, um, the larger uh, research that uh, I do demonstrates how this has emerged uh, uh, since the collapse of socialism in 1988 and the transition to this um, form of uh, uh, militarized capitalism, oligarchic capitalism since um, uh, through, through the 1990s. So there's a clear need for a more robust um, state response, um, whether that looks like expanding social protection through direct cash, cash, cash payments to specific populations, um, extending in-kind aid where supply chains have been disrupted, um, and um, you know, uh, you know, major investments in public works, for example, Myanmar has a, a significant backlog of, of infrastructure, um, uh, and that may be one way in which to provide employment opportunities at a localised level to informal sector workers. Um, uh, but what kind of interventions are necessary uh, and where, um, and how to implement them, um, and what's, what's their impact? Um, uh, things that, that um, it, there is uh, really not sufficient research at the moment. So I just want to kind of raise a couple of key, key questions here. The first is that I think social research is critical to informing the COVID response in Myanmar, but from the sounds of, of what we're all um, uh, uh, um, referring, that, that's, that's critical. Um, and this is especially important because many of the narratives and public discussions about COVID um, uh, is framed around um, testing uh, and the capacity to measure the effects of lockdown consequences on the flattening of curves and data-centric um, uh, capacities that come from highly developed health systems, um, uh, i.e. as the numbers drop, that lockdowns can be eased. Um, in the context of Myanmar, the very weak health system capacity means that spread or impact of lockdowns uh, uh, or the consequences and their effectiveness is very hard to track um, through testing. Uh, and, and that raises this question about how do you inform decision making about the response um, while reducing the impacts on the informal sector um, and providing where you can social safety nets. Um, we know that um, work uh, by colleagues like uh, Vanessa and, and others at pandemics such as Ebola um, uh, often see a worsening burden on the most vulnerable and informal households. That's been a recurring feature of all of the presentations. Um, uh, and the questions then become how do you provide a basis for advocacy around broadening social protections? Um, how do you measure the consequences of cash transfers that are provided and other payment initiatives um, on the precarity that's being exacerbated in the current context? And how do you track the politics of welfare um, of informal taxation in particular, which we're going to see a massive expansion of, um, as we all expect in, uh, over the coming months and, and years, um, both from state and, and non-state institutions? Um, and uh, how do you collect fine-grained data um, which tracks the impacts over time of COVID and of the, re the response efforts um, uh, and how do you use that to inform policy? Um, so obviously multi-wave tracking data um, is going to be really important going back to the same people and trying to assess what that um, the impacts of COVID and all of the economic and social um, upheaval that it brings, what does that actually look like for, for households? So tracking that over time is going to be really important when we can do that. Um, quantitative data needs to be coupled with a study of the mechanisms and process, processes going on, um, and especially qualitative interviews. These sort of rapid snapshot um, surveys aren't necessarily going to give us an idea of the, the granularities of the politics of, of voice and negotiation that might all be happening at a local level in many cases. Um, so the question, the second kind of question then becomes how do you do responsible, responsible research in, in a time of COVID, um, and especially in Myanmar? where face-to-face -face interviews are obviously very risky and very inadvisable in, in the current context. You don't want your um, uh, you know, research um, uh, in, you know, uh, interviewers uh, being exposed to potential risk of, of, of spreading um, the, the disease or picking it up. Um, so how do you contact respondents and build semi-representative samples, especially of the informal economy? Um, so just kind of kicking around ideas with collaborators in the last couple of weeks, there's a few kind of options um, that we've come up with. The first is just straight phone interviews, right? So um, uh, do partner organisations that, that we work with have existing phone databases of um, uh, informal economy workers um, or just of households um, where um, on average that we know that uh, there's going to be people employed in the informal economy in, in many households and, and how do you think about a, a representative sample of that from a gender perspective, urban rural perspective, etc. Um, a second option, um, and this is something that's been done by Jay Powell um, in uh, Indonesia, 
um, is Google surveys, um, uh, which uh, they've set up a 500 household um, Google survey that goes out um, every uh, goes out every week, um, which is tracking employment, food, migration, and um, access to services. Um, uh, I've got a link to it in that um, uh, in that PowerPoint. I can share the PowerPoint um, with those who are interested. Um, uh, but uh, Google surveys is not available in all uh, contexts, and obviously there's a lot of uh, limitations, as we've already spoken about, about access to um, uh, even access to Google services um, uh, in different contexts. Um, uh, Google uh, surveys doesn't operate in Myanmar, um, uh, but also access, to, obviously, to to, um, uh, to internet and access to um, uh, uh, access to um, uh, those surveys. So another, a third option outside of Google surveys, if you don't, if you don't, um, don't have Google surveys in your context, would be online surveys, um, uh, which you know, gives you the strength of a more formalized structure, but then it's also challenging gathering a representative sample in many cases. So the fourth option, which sounds a bit wacky, um, but it's one that we're strongly considering uh, in the context of Myanmar, um, is what we call chatbots, um, which is conversational artificial intelligence. I'll just go over this very quickly. Um, so I'm sure you've probably all seen chatbots um, in a, uh, you know, on your banking website if you haven't already encountered them before. Um, but basically, um, uh, one of the things that we're exploring is whether it's possible to develop a semi-representative national sample um, conducting rapid um, uh, snapshot surveys using uh, uh, what the, the kind of interaction set that, that is on the side of the right of the screen here. Um, uh, you know, basic um, uh, conversations between a chatbot, which is loaded with questions, basically survey questions with um, uh, maybe two or three different kind of responses, um, and uh, you know, getting an indicator from that of um, uh, enough, a few very basic kind of measures. Um, have you gone into debt in the last um, uh, uh, two weeks? Um, uh, what things have you gone into debt for? You know, things with two or three or four, or four options, probably not more than about five. Um, uh, you can have capacity to, to solicit basic information very rapidly, it can be used also to disperse information via two way flow of information. So, providing links to COVID um, uh, 19 health advisories um, is something that our partner ONOW has been doing, Opportunities Now Myanmar has been doing in, um, uh, 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 with their rapid surveys that they've been doing. Um, and it's also being used by the World Health Organization. So Myanmar is a, a somewhat peculiar case in which 80% um, of the population as a result of a very late um, uh, digitization and, and liberalization of telecommunications, 80% of the country have smartphones. But obviously there are geographical and social strata limits to that. Um, but this could potentially be useful for a very rapid survey. And we know that we're getting some of the best metrics and um, sort of detail, especially from rural areas where it's socially responsible to send people. Um, uh, uh, very good indicators of debt, how much debt people are going into returning migrants, this kind of data, and um, it's very cheap. Thousand completions uh, uh, in two days for less than $500 um, across six cities, um, which is tremendously um, low, uh, tremendously cheap, obviously. Um, uh, there are limitations to it, as I noted, um, but there's also a lot of opportunity for expanding this into a more phone-based interview sample, right? So you can ask, um, and as, uh, as our partners have done, asking for phone numbers at the end of the interaction and then calling them up, either confirming the data, but also having more in-depth kind of qualitative conversations about mechanisms, processes, whether they've received different kinds of grants and the impacts of them. The number of different projects, ideas that are coming out of this kind of question about a mixed methods, you know, sort of chatbot qualitative um, uh, combination in the, combina in the context of, of Myanmar. Um, rapid national snap snapshots that could be done weekly, um, but broken down regionally to provide advice to government about where and what sectors and regions are encountering different kinds of impacts. Um, MSE, MSME and formal sector studies specifically about businesses, as well as more in-depth um, sort of qualitative and potentially digitally ethnographic studies of, you know, governance diaries of the poor, how do people interact with different authorities, access different kinds of schemes and, um, and authorities um, at, at this time. So it gives you very, very, very broad ideas of some of the ways that we're trying to, to sort of Rubik's Cube, some of those complicated problems of methodology and, and surveying in, in a responsible way um, for the project of Myanmar. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Gerard. Uh, really interesting to hear more about the context in Myanmar, but also to see how some similar themes are really obvious across different contexts in terms of the vulnerabilities, as well as the responses. Um, also really interesting to, to hear some of your ideas about how to go about collecting uh, research at this time.
Um, I should also thank you as well for joining us from Singapore, where it is uh, probably uh, your bedtime. So thank you for staying up late to, to share your thoughts. Um, now, thank you to all of our panelists, though that opened a really, really wonderful discussion. Um, we're very lucky to also have uh, two uh, wonderful discussants. We're going to uh, try to keep the discussants uh, time fairly short so that we still have time for an open discussion. We'll ask uh, each of you to stick to about five minutes. Uh, the first discussant that I would like to introduce is Christoph Tideka. He is a senior lecturer based at the Institute of Development Policy at the University of Antwerp. Uh, and he has done extensive research on governance and conflict in spaces of, of weak state, uh, where there is a weak state institutional presence. So he has particular expertise in uh, Central and Eastern Africa. Thank you, Christophe. All right. Thanks, Vanessa. I'll be very brief. I will not take uh, five minutes. I would just like to highlight some main points or some major issues. Um, because it seems, well, to me, it seems that the current COVID crisis acts as a kind of magnifying glass to highlight what could be considered uh, major issues in research on informal economies, or even on research, research on these issues broader. Um, so, first of all, throughout all the discussions, um, it is highlighted well what is a major theme in research on this issue. Well, what does informality mean in these circumstances? You know, what is, what is the relevance of, of, of the term? So on the one hand, the crisis could be used to say, well, um, is this really about informality or is this about situations of what could be termed high vulnerability, difficult livelihoods, about having access to health, access to security, and so on. Some of the issue, well, some of the figures which were presented kind of highlighted that. Um, also in Pakistan, it was 72% of non-farming households which were informal in Myanmar, over 50% and so on. If it's that dominant, you know, what, what, what does it teach us, both analytically and policy-wise? On the other hand, it could be argued, well, this crisis actually shows the relevance of, of this term because it highlights, well, and as Kate's work has shown extensively, it highlights particular political dynamics at stake and social dynamics, or um, I forgot who said so, even the spatial dynamics of, of, of informality. And one thing which kept coming back throughout the different presentations was the issue of uh, voice. Um, the wider literature and formality has shown well, um, I think it was Rachel who said, well, an institutionalized dialogue is more difficult with informal workers. And as I had been shown voice, it's mainly through personal linkages, through patronage, uh, through linkages with uh, particular politicians uh, and, and so on. So what does this mean in the current circumstances? What does this mean for a dialogue or for a quote unquote social contract? What does this mean for interventions? How do you evaluate interventions if it's not possible to have this kind of institutionalized dialogue? What does this mean if the current governance structures worldwide are strongly tilting towards more authoritarian structures? Um, how do you activate your personal linkages if there's this ten tendency towards a centralized government? What does this mean for the scales on which um, informality is working if there's a strong push towards uh, centralization? And how do you evaluate these uh, interventions? And perhaps lastly, um, well, what does this tell us? It was mentioned in a couple of presentations. What, what does this tell us about how we go about in actually doing research? Also here, it can act as a magnifying glass. If we are forced to do some kind of remote control research, how do you guarantee that it doesn't further, further tilt power relationships towards inequality? How do you make sure that not the most vulnerable are actually pushed to go out in the field and collect data? How do you actually keep that balance? I'll stop it here. Okay, thank you, Christoph. Um, before we kind of open it up to the wider set of questions, I'd really love to very quickly throw to um, Phil Mader, 
who's a research fellow at IDS and who's done a lot of work, uh, particularly also on the intersection between informality and uh, microcredit and microfinance. Um, and uh, I think bringing an aspect of debt into this, an aspect of, of financing, um, given the, uh, uh, especially also the medium to long-term outlook of the crisis will, will be really important. So I will throw it to Phil. Thanks, Max, and thank you everyone for these really uh, insightful and fine-grained impacts. Just to make two, to briefly highlight two cross-cutting issues related to the informal sector and the financial system, I want to say something briefly about the pressures of debt on informal sector workers and low-income uh, families under these circumstances, on top of the, the, all the disruptions that we've already talked about, and second, the effects of apparently growing uh, fear of cash. So, you know, it's clear that low-income people and workers in the informal sector are shouldering significant debt burdens already. As households, they often have negative uh, financial net worth and additionally are at risk of uh, falling into debt quite even uh, quicker than others and taking longer than others to get out. And they're less likely to be reached by many of the financial and macroeconomic relief efforts, as some of the speakers today have noted already, uh, that have been put underway by governments. So um, several governments have already reacted and, you know, instituted things like debt moratoria or uh, announced relatively vague, um, you know, uh, slowdowns in repayment plans. But these are often uh, voluntary and it's unclear to what extent uh, banks are complying with them. From India, I can report that the uh, microfinance industry body has said that the microfinance institutions it represents have um, passed the benefits of a moratorium on to micro borrowers, a moratorium that the Reserve Bank of India has um, allowed banks to uh, give. But in turn, a lot of the banks that have lent to microfinance institutions still are actually charging uh, on the loans that um, they have made to the microfinance institutions. So it's probably just a matter of time until the MFIs in India pass the pressure on to their borrowers. Again, meanwhile, in North Africa, the Egyptian government has. Uh, uh, has stalled some payments. In Morocco, there seems to be another debt problem brewing. So the uh, Committee for the Abolition of Illegitimate Debt has already called for cancelling microfinance loans because um, precisely those people who work in the informal sector have not been reached by what the government has put in place to um, uh, a system whereby it's regulated for large formal banks to defer payments to people who have lost their jobs. But if you're working in the informal sector, you're not counted as having lost your job. And the second thing I wanted to mention is, is a fear of cash that is likely to uh, be a major problem for large parts of the informal economy in many countries because informal sector businesses and more generally poorer sections of society, most developing countries rely on cash payments for a variety of reasons, including technological barriers, uh, but also uh, literacy, convenience, habit, and simply the higher cost of digital payments. So. A few weeks ago, there was quite a gross misrepresentation of uh, WHO guidance by actually the UK's Telegraph newspaper, um, which forced the WHO to lodge an official complaint that they did not say cash was transmitting coronavirus and to clarify that they're not actually uh, promoting the use of contactless payments as opposed to what the Telegraph had reported. The message from the WHO is simply to wash your hands after making any sort of payment. Uh, because from what's currently known, the virus actually lives longer on plastic or metal surfaces than on cloth or paper. But still, uh, many people and businesses around the world seem to have unilaterally decided to no longer engage in cash transactions. And uh, at the same time, payment industry uh, bodies like the Better Than Cash Alliance have uh, taken the pandemic as an opportunity to promote digital payments in uh, developing countries. For instance, proposing things like the digital wage payments to health workers would be the key to keeping health systems running. Um, now, it may be true that digital payments can be helpful in such ways, but it's really important that they are just part of a plurality of payment rails rather than a single monopoly payment channel, because uh, the devastating effects of disrupting cash payments could be really seen just a few years ago in, in India's uh, disastrous demonetization experiment in 2016, where the economy ground to a halt and even possibly more than 100 deaths were directly attributable to the inability to access and pay for basic services. So um, just to mention these as additional pressures that are on, on the informal sector, people shouldering debts that they struggle to repay even more now and may be pushed into quite unfortunate situations of indebtedness further. 
the, and secondly, struggling to make any sort of payments that are necessary to survive if um, cash uh, is officially or unofficially being uh, kind of removed from the picture. Uh, thank you very much, Phil. So we're going to switch to uh, questions from kind of the wider audience, which includes uh, a the rest of the people on uh, the Zoom call, but also the I think earlier was 175 people on YouTube. Um, if you do want to ask questions, uh, if, you, if you're on the Zoom call, if you just want to write them into the uh, Zoom chat. Uh, if you're on YouTube, if you want to write them on the comment section, and uh, Steph will pick them up and, and also add them to the Zoom meeting so we can see them. Uh, I think the procedure might just be that Vanessa and I pick out questions uh, from those chats and kind of throw them to the panelists. So it would be ideal if your question would include a brief statement of, of who you are and, and your affiliation, if, if you like, um, or if this is directed to any particular panelists. Um, your question can be a statement. It just makes it less likely that we'll pick it up and ask the, the panelists. Um, and uh, we will try to get to as, as many as we can. We're a little bit um, pressed for time, of course, but in that case, we'll just start. And maybe I'll pick up one question from uh, Will Monte, who asks, uh, what are the most appropriate scales for intervention, national versus municipal? Uh, do municipal governments appear to be more responsive to the needs of informal workers than others? It's not directed to anyone in particular, but maybe especially from the kind of maybe from the more uh, activist side, maybe Rachel, uh, do you think there's a uh, trade off here between working on a more national level or an international level as Viego frequently does or on a local level? Um, actually, we have a lot of work grounded in cities. Um, so we do see the value of working at the municipal level. But I would say that it really depends on what kind of intervention you're talking about. So if you're talking about cash transfers, um, much of that is determined at the national level or, you know, in federal systems at the state level. But it, it is obviously, in many cases, above the municipal level. If you're talking about the redistribution of food rations, then yes, the municipal level is probably uh, effective to target. Also, if you're talking about the classification of who is an essential worker, who should get protective gear, who should not, um, I would say that that, um, that classification can be done at the municipal level. We've seen examples of both, both at the municipal and national levels, directives being given around that. But in terms of the actual access and distribution um, that would of protective gear, that would probably happen at the municipal level in negotiations with the, with the municipalities. Um, I, I, I think, it, it, yeah, I, I would just say that it really depends on what interventions you're looking to to influence and, and who then is your interlocutor at, uh, within government. Uh, great, thanks. So uh, another question uh, targeted at Rachel, but I think that will be relevant uh, to uh, other panelists as well. Uh, from Sylvia Garcia Tellez, uh, she asks about some of the uh, complications of doing research in this area and perhaps some of the fears that informal workers may have in engaging in this research, particularly in thinking about backlashes from governments or some of the tax measures that could be imposed on them as soon as government may have more information about them. So if anyone has any particular thoughts on, on those particular challenges. Just on this question of, uh, sorry, uh, just a qu quick point on this question of sort of conditionality uh, of documentation being attached to the kind of assistance that it's being made. I think that's something that a lot of governments, uh, at least uh, that government in Pakistan is, is also sort of considering it's something that they've, uh, that they've been thinking about, that you somehow tie assistance to uh, informal sector uh, enterprises sort of coming within the realm of documentation. And I think that's a, that's a uh, you know, it's a very tempting thing, but as Max highlighted at the start, uh, that this is something that uh, policymakers and activists need to be very wary about that whether this entire uh, uh, sort of a crisis is somehow not taken into uh, a very different direction and it doesn't become a source of extraction or tax extraction which already sort of pushes which will you know have its own sort of negative impacts and ad adverse consequences on informal uh, sector enterprises so i think it's certainly something which uh, which is uh, which which is part of the conversation uh, but uh, but I would think that it is uh, it is a pretty major red flag as far as uh, as far as sort of you know the precarity of these uh, of of the workforce is concerned. Uh, 
Just to add to that, I, I think it's, um, I, I, I certainly agree with that point, and I would only add that I think we need to, to make a distinction between informal workers and informal enterprises. So when you look at, um, when, you, when you look at the self-employment within the informal economy, let's take Africa, for instance, 63% of informal workers are, um, are self-employed. That 63%, only 2% of that is act, are, of those informal workers are employers. Uh, 46% are actually own account workers and 15% are contributing family workers. So you can basically assume that the own account workers and the contributing family workers have no capacity to pay income tax um, or corporate or any form of corporate tax. But also that even those own account workers are paying, for instance, if they're working in a market or working on a city street, they are paying some sort of form of taxation. And, and Kate can speak more to that and others as well. So I, I think we need to be to be careful about not confusing enterprise and workers uh, and recognizing um, that many workers would fall outside of the sort of direct taxation, um, but that they are also contributing in other ways and licensing fees and market dues, which may not fall direct, which may not fall within the tax system as it's defined. Um, so I'll leave it there for others to add as well. Can I just jump in and make, make the point that I think it's um, something that uh, I've uh, done a lot of work on in the context of Myanmar is conceptualizing the contributions that um, payments for welfare services um, uh, and essential things that in many other cases are um, uh, provided by the state, um, uh, social welfare protection at a local level, um, are often funded through the, you know, the mechanisms of donations and redistribution that's occurring. And I think it's also important that we, we need to, to look at that mechanism, which is going to expand massively um, uh, over the coming months in terms of providing people who are already the most vulnerable, also simultaneously being um, the, the source of social protection for those around them. Um, and that, that, that in, in needs to be conceptualized as a form of informal taxation in context where governments are not willing to fill those bridges um, uh, those breaches and, you know, in, in the context of um, countries refusing to, to provide, um, uh, you know, stimulus packages or, uh, you know, social protection schemes. So I think it, it's worthwhile, I think, raising those localised social protection schemes within a larger conversation about informal taxation as well. So if I can just come in on, on that for a sec as well, I think um, sometimes people get a bit caught up in definitions um, and fail to recognize that most informal actors already pay tax. They pay, uh, as somebody has mentioned, market fees. Most uh, informal workers in African countries have been paying tax at the local government level since the late colonial period at the very minimum. Um, as was already indicated by Gerard, they also pay all kinds of social contributions. And it's these informal associations and uh, kinship networks, etc., to which they pay self-help social contributions that are being asked to take up the slack um, to fill in the gaps for the, the um, food rations. Uh, it's certainly in Nigeria with the lockdown, many people who can't get enough of food, who have to work every day for their, their food, uh, simply rely on networks who get food to people who need things, um, kinship networks, friendship networks, et cetera. So there's a, a huge amount of informal taxation as well as ongoing formal taxation that already takes place. And this fixation with widening the tax base by focusing attention on vulnerable workers who already pay various types of formal and informal tax and turning away from the people who have all of the resources. Um, the, the very idea that Donald Trump would say that people should stop paying into the formal sector uh, social welfare um, uh, contributions so that uh, people can have more cash in their hands ignores the fact that the tax system formal and informal, is a fundamentally redistributive system. The idea is that there are people who are below the tax threshold, but they still merit uh, various types of, of social support and income. And there are people who are very high up in the tax bracket uh, 
who are the most important source of, of taxation. And I think we've all seen over the years that there are many um, concerns about the ways in which people at the top are paying less, less tax. And in order to replace what's lost, we're turning to the people at the very bottom who have very little to contribute and already pay. Okay. Um, without, because this would frivol be frivolous mentioning that we do have a piece on taxing the informal economy coming out next week. I'm going to uh, pick up a question by uh, Cyrus Polycarpio, who asks, um, while we understand that universal approach to cash food assistance is ideal, however, the resources could be limited to cover all. As such, is segment focused assistance a better option? Or to kind of maybe tie that to um, the point that Kate had in her uh, presentation, which was that there, there is a trade off here between different policy options, right? There's a trade off between targeting and more kind of universal aspirations or approaches. And there's uh, both for kind of activists and, and for governments, their priorities to be set here. So maybe I will throw that question to the, to the panel. Uh, if I can um, start the ball rolling there, um, certainly the resources to cover cash transfers. Um, one of the, the things that many people have been asking in, in South Africa and in Nigeria that I've heard so far is that if the government had all this money to bring out, to pick up all of these new costs, uh, income replacement, et cetera, if they had this money all along, why are we only hearing it about it now? Why suddenly are we hearing that, that uh, resources can be mobilized to, to meet these needs? Uh, but up until now, we were being told there was no money, we need austerity. So there, there's a, a certain extent to which the issue of whether there is enough money is a bit of a spurious issue. Whenever somebody decides that the issue is important enough, money is mobilized and money can be constantly mobilized through um, uh, a progressive tax system so that um, you can do a universal basic income and then tax back from the higher income bracket. It's very easy, no issue of targeting. Um, there are varieties of ways uh, through tax systems, through uh, uh, monetary systems of, of raising resources. It's more a question of priorities than of uh, lack of, of resources. Um, that seems to have answered the question very well. <laughs> so uh, I will throw a couple questions. I'll try to uh, summarize them together. Uh, going back to the conversation that we were just starting about um, community-based approaches to, to uh, response efforts. So linking to what uh, Gerard was talking about in the context of Myanmar, about how uh, charity and informal taxation the burden of, of responses is actually um, shifting to, to um, individuals and communities through those mechanisms. So uh, uh, Jadabas, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, she, she's asking how um, uh, the role of community-based approaches, uh, what role it can play in supporting the response uh, for, for, especially for rural and hard to reach populations. Uh, but relatedly, uh, Dami Lola asks, you know, in, in context where there are no records uh, and there's no formal and existing ways of dealing with informal sectors and particularly in contexts where um, community-based organizations like churches or mosques or civil society organizations are, are not accessible or are not operating under lockdowns. Are there ways that, um, you know, what issues does this present for uh, social welfare provision in, uh, in the crisis period? Uh, but perhaps also uh, for shifting uh, state society relations in the post-crisis period. So maybe directed specifically to Gerard, but also, uh, of course, more broadly. Thank you. Um, I, I think there's um, there's a really big question here about the role that that uh, community-based organisations and, and localised kind of what what Kate was describing the, the sort of mechanisms of of reciprocity and kinship at a local level that then begin to formalise. Um, and I think they are especially critical in contexts where um, the formal apparatus of state aid is very weak. Um, and uh, especially in, you know, in um, a Myanmar context, contested areas 
um, where the trust in government authority, which is already fragile in kind of low land areas where government administration is stronger, um, those community intermediaries are going to be particularly critical in providing a bridge between uh, ethnic armed uh, groups and the government um, in how to provide, I mean, there's obviously the health response side and, and in the Myanmar case, there has been some collaboration between the, um, uh, the government health uh, systems and uh, ethnic armed uh, groups and ethnic health systems. Um, many of those uh, armed groups also run their own affiliated health systems. Um, but it's, uh, I think that we're gonna see a particularly important role for religious organizations um, uh, and those community organizations as collecting information about who the most vulnerable and most impacted are in those contexts. Um, and it's, it's something just worth kind of flagging. It's in those contexts in particular, where at least in the Myanmar um, uh, context, that those areas are, have been the highest migration. So huge numbers of people um, in those contested regions have moved to Thailand over the last two, three decades um, for work um, uh, and have now returned, many of them. And so those are areas where those community organisations are going to play a particularly critical role in bridging between the different authorities and brokering assistance. And in many ways, there's, there's a lot of potential politics there. Um, as, as Christoph mentioned earlier, the, the sort of patronage and clientelism in areas of sort of informal authority as well, um, of uh, armed groups potentially um, uh, and, and government authorities contesting over who gets to provide COVID support to different um, areas of the country. So um, I think that there's, there's a whole variety of different dimensions to that role, but it's going to be particularly important in, in those contested regions. So. Maybe just quickly to add here, I mean, I, I said it in my presentation and, and it's certainly a, a way of, in which we see our work in, in sort of strengthening member-based organizations of informal workers and many of them are being called on right now to provide some of this community support be it food rations or registration for for cash transfers um, but i i do want to stress the sort of uh, that community structures can also be hierarchical and patriarchal um, and so just being very careful about or at least understanding the limitations that the, this may be a temporary measure, but that there is a reason for why social assistance is not delivered through community mechanisms uh, in most cases, that there is a reason why the, this is actually structured through government. Um, and many of the countries that we've mentioned in this, in, in this discussion actually do have some form of cash transfer that is coming from a national level. So, um, but that design is intentional in that we have seen that going through community structure or community structures as they are doesn't necessarily work. So that sort of short term versus long term, how do we how do we think about the role of um, community structures now in sort of active response, but how do we transition out of that? Because that's a not a sustainable response, but also not a structural response. Um, when we're thinking about building social protection systems, financing social protection systems, and thinking about taxation and its role in that. So um, I'll leave it there. Maybe others have something to say. <laughs> yeah, I just had I just had two very quick points to add to this. I think the first is I completely agree with the uh, with the responsibility of the state here. I think the first um, I think that I wanted to flag was uh, that this is obviously a lot of this is is uh, is predicated on the existing landscape of or organizational landscape of philanthropy that exists in in different countries, and I think that there's a great deal of variation across different countries in terms of what kind of actors are available. I think. Uh, linked to this, I think we also know that uh, where it is possible, community and uh, and kinship-based networks would already be supporting uh, vulnerable uh, households, and they're probably already being tapped uh, to uh, to cover up at least some of the the, the subsistence-related crises in particular that we're facing. Uh, but I think uh, again, the the exclusions, the hierarchies that are often associated with these uh, with these networks, I think they um, uh, that's a that's a completely valid uh, risk to to identify, which is why I think uh, as a policy position. Uh, I think uh, community-based 
interventions should be supported. They should be, uh, they should be encouraged, but I think the final responsibility ultimately rests with the state and the resource quantum that is required is also something that only the state, as Kate has already identified, that, that only the state can actually mobilize. So I think, uh, uh, I think we need to be very careful about how we uh, phrase the differential importance given to each kind of intervention and who the actors leading that intervention is. I think the bug does stop with the state as far as uh, a crisis of this particular scale is concerned. Okay, I think I'll try to slip in one final question um, before we're running out of time. Um, we've had earlier discussions about the kind of the newly essential or the, or the, or the vis visibility of, of some informal actors. There's been quite a few questions in the um, chat and in the comments on YouTube all around stigma and informality in the context of, of this pandemic. There's one question that asks, the fishermen of India are highly affected because of the fear generated towards their identities. What can we do to address this and are there other countries facing similar examples? Again, I think that could be to the entire panel. Um, the, the whole idea of, of stigmatizing informal actors or particular groups within informal actors, if I understood the question particularly, um, I think is, is a big problem because informal uh, actors are becoming visible in particular ways, becoming visible as crowded people, as people who touch money, as people who um, uh, come out into the in, into the world um, when people are asked to stay home. So there are many ways in which what is happening now, in addition to putting informal operators much more on the political agenda, is also drawing a lot of attention to the ways in which they will be seen increasingly as, I think as, um, I think it was Gerard who put it very interestingly, as vectors of disease rather than vectors of remittances. Um, and as uh, various types of value chains and informal activities close down, their ability to serve as the sources of, of income, dispersing it into communities will weaken. And the dangers that they pose to the wider society in terms of, of health conditions, in, in terms of their living conditions, their economic activities, et cetera, will be increasingly emphasized. And I see the real dangers in increasingly right-wing populist states where religious practices, um, particular types of activities that one wants to clear out will simply be targeted as something that involves a, a negative community or a, a stigmatized community, a stigmatized activity, et cetera, can be easily targeted for repression. So I think there are a lot of risks in the kind of visibility that is, is taking place and that there is a real need to be politically aware of how the informal economy is shaped in terms of its relationship with these diseases. And that might be, um, might signal some of the ways in which informal organization, informal um, uh, unions um, may think about how better to adapt public health responses to actually be uh, practicable in informal uh, contexts so that people can respond to um, public health concerns in ways that are useful rather than in, in ways that are simply uh, a response to their own uh, risk profiles. Okay, I think I will uh, have to kind of end the discussion here, unfortunately, um, and start some final, final comments by thanking the speakers uh, for, for making the time for some of you getting up very early, some of you uh, staying up uh, quite late to join us, as well as the, uh, the vast number of participants. Uh, I'm very sorry that we weren't able to address all the questions, but um, even as someone who spent the kind of last few weeks uh, talking to some of the other people on the panel about this, I was really amazed with how many new things came out in this, and I've, I've learned a lot today. I thought it was incredibly, um, visible again how much uh, crisis can can make some things visible that were always there but we had to spend so much time pointing out and I mean kind of both the the way that informality overlaps with with wider globalization I mean the, I think the point came up in multiple presentations that 
uh, there was a crisis in formality before kind of it was a crisis of infection in these countries because it's so embedded in, in global trade links, but also the way that this crisis has once again brought out differentiations within the informal economy, right? The, the newly essential and the newly even less visible. Uh, as well as I think in the, in the final discussion, uh, the degree to which all of this is still connected to the state. And I think we'll, we'll see both in developing countries, but also in developed countries, once this immediate uh, wave of, of crisis and relief is over, a, a new discussion around fiscal relationships and a new discussion um, around how this will be paid for, how, how healthcare will be organized, um, who has been excluded and what we've learned from that. And um, that there is a role for a discussion about the informal economy in this and, and I think a rediscussion of issue around formalization and taxation. Um, but I will resist the, the temptation of, of taking up any more of your time and just uh, say that we didn't quite knew what this was going to be. I mean, I mentioned in the beginning uh, that we originally thought this was going to be at about 12 people in a Zoom room and now it's been uh, multiple hundreds. Um, so we also didn't really quite know what was going to happen after this or what should happen after this. If there should be more discussions about this, if they should look differently, if there should be more, more, more research. Um, so I think I will leave it as tell us. I mean, if, if you've enjoyed this, if you've been a part of this, if, if this is, has, has raised new questions, feel free to get in touch with us and also kind of tell us what you think this, this should be here from here on. Um, also, I'm told that the people who joined on YouTube were unable to see any links that were shared and had trouble seeing some of the slides. So in that case, I would like to say that we will try to put, for any of the speakers who shared their slides, put the slides on uh, the ICTD website. Um, we will also try to put any links that were shared throughout this, including, I think, to, to Rachel's report um, on the ICTD website. Um, there's also uh, on that website a call for, for papers. We're currently accepting um, uh, proposals for research projects in this area if someone is working on something like this. But um, most uh, centrally, once again, thanks very much to the speakers for making the time. Thanks for all the questions. And this has been really, really enjoyable for us and I hope for, for the participants as well.